could be tuned in. So thank you everyone for coming today. Um, so I'm very excited to introduce our panel. Um, this event has been sort of a few months in the making and so glad this is happening. So our first panelist today is Linda. So when I first went back to, when I went back to Singapore over the summer, I was at a popular bookstore. And, and at the economic section, half of those books have Linda's name on it. So, so we are really, it's, we really have an esteemed panel today. So Linda is Professor of Strategy at the Stephen Ross School of Business at the University of Michigan. And she has been writing extensively about the Singapore economic model. So without further ado, I will pass the mic on to Linda. Okay, thank you very much. Um, you know, the reason that I'm out there is just because I'm very old. I have been doing this for a very long time and uh, lived through the entire sort of 50 years uh, of uh, 51 years now of Singapore. So what I'm going to do is just very quickly summarize the Singapore's uh, development story. Make a few points. First, much of Singapore's success in the first three decades as a sovereign nation are not particularly exceptional. Why? Singapore started out with many favorable initial conditions, for those of you into development economics. It was the second richest country in Asia after Japan. It is still only the second richest after Macau now. Uh, it had good infrastructure and institutions from its role in the British colonial economy. It was English speaking, had an entrepreneurial native population, a good location, was a hub for regional trade and investment. It was not a fishing village or a malarial swamp, which is what I read a lot about in business uh, uh, media uh, last year. So it's not a, it started out in a very favorable position. Secondly, the growth was based on labor-intensive export manufacturing, and that was completely conventional, in line with comparative advantage at the time. It was following a path already set by other Asian economies, Taiwan, Korea, Hong Kong, and before that, uh, uh, over in this part of the world, Puerto Rico and the Mexican border. Thirdly, it developed what we call competitive advantages through state investment in infrastructure, education, targeted investment incentives for capital, restraints on labor organization and action, political authoritarianism, all were also similar to what the other East Asian newly industrialized economies uh, had. And later they were joined by Malaysia uh, and China. A few policies were distinctive, that is different from other East Asians from the beginning. First, the early emphasis on social policy, housing, health, pensions, population, which were integrated into a state-driven economic model. Second, heavy reliance on foreign multinationals, rather than domestic entrepreneurs, as opposed to the other Asian uh, economies which had a strong national business class. And third, an early and heavy reliance on foreign labor and skills. So those three things were different from Korea and Taiwan and Hong Kong. So these policies continued and even increased as the economy grew and ascended the income and technological ladder with state-directed industrial upgrading efforts beginning as early as 1979, which I wrote a paper on. Divergence from other East Asian, uh, it di diverged from other East Asians in the following ways. As the economy developed, the state did not wither away, but rather entrenched and intensified its participation in the economy, arguably crowding out the domestic private sector which therefore did not grow large local companies to drive the economy. Okay, so that's very distinctively different from other Asian countries. Industrial targeting was ratcheted up, distorting the allocation of resources, uh, and instead there was, the economy became increasingly reliant on GLCs, government linked companies, or TLCs, domestic linked companies. So that's sort of unusual, right? As you get more developed, instead of the state stepping back and letting the private sector take over, the state actually increases its activity. Secondly, the dependence on multinationals also increased for capital investments, technology, global market access, in increasingly high-tech and knowledge-intensive sectors and industries because we didn't have that. After 30 years, we still had to go to multinationals for that. Thirdly, the reliance on foreign labor and talent also increased most dramatically after 2000. At the same time, as the state was increasingly venturing into production, 
It started privatizing or partially privatizing some social services and provisions, including housing and transportation. Okay, so what was social became private, and you know the the, the state grew in the, in, in the production sector, but but shrank, relatively speaking, in the social sector. The political system also did not liberalize as it did in Korea and Taiwan. The result is all this entrenched what is called an extensive growth model dependent on ever increasing inputs of capital and labor. It's very easy to get more output if you have more input. I believe, uh, I don't know whether it was Paul Krugman or someone long ago yep. referred to it as the sausage machine, right? You put more pork in, you get more sausage out. That's it. So it's, a, it's a quantitative uh, and it's referred to as extensive growth. You need to pump more capital, more labor. Inevitably, this resulted in diminishing marginal returns and low productivity growth, as well as increased negative externalities like congestion costs turning Singapore into an extremely high cost location. State targeting of life sciences, pharmaceuticals, chemical export clusters, very capital intensive, creating very few and high skilled jobs disproportionately for foreigners, also increased uh, volatility. I asked one of my students, a, a physics PhD, who was setting up an R&D uh, outfit in Singapore for Japanese multinationals, and he said they went there because they thought there were people to hire where they were, so they, they went for Google search. They found two people, one from Austria and one from Netherlands, brought them to Singapore for the operation, and then one of them left. And so it was, it was uh, quite, quite interesting that you know, we targeted sectors in which there were no Singaporeans. Um, there was also increased dependence on foreign labor and talent, increased skill premiums, increased inequality. Growth slowed down, became heavily reliant on property development and construction, much of it undertaken by GLCs and by foreign unskilled labor. So the current challenges all reflect the obsolescence of this state-driven, multinational-led, import-intensive, export-oriented development model. Why is it, why are we in trouble now? One, globalization is declining, including a declining tolerance worldwide for capital subsidies through tax incentives. Secondly, technological change is advancing. So this model of being a strategic follower does not work. Once you're at the top of the ladder with no visibility, nobody knows what's out there, so you can't follow. It's, you know, Singapore is very good at following. Uh, thirdly, global supply chains are increasingly focused on consolidation in a few large final markets rather than the fragmented and geographically dispersed uh, structures they had before. Increased competition as comparative advantage shifts and competitive advantage with other countries narrows. Our first come advantage has shrunk. So for example, our, life, our uh, medical tourism is losing out to Malaysia and Thailand. And the Singapore population is aging with the problem of low fertility. So what is to be done? Like other East Asians, including China, uh, there's talk about a shift to consumption-driven domestic services and SMEs. That's what everybody else is doing. The problem is, when you have that kind of model, Singapore lacks uh, indigenous innovation. It lacks an innovative, entrepreneurial, domestic business culture due to decades of state and multinational dependence and lack of political liberalization. And finally, definitely is needed a regional market orientation to Southeast Asia. I'm done. Okay. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Linda. Well, that's a lot, and we will definitely unpack those open remarks throughout the course of the evening. So our next speaker today is PJ. So PJ is the coordinator of Project Southeast Asia and a research associate at the Centre for Global History at the University of Oxford. His work centres around the decolonization of Singapore and its continuing impact on Southeast Asian governance and politics. And he's a creator of a very good podcast called The History of Singapore, a weekly radio show on BFM 89.9 in Malaysia. And at one point I think uh, PJ was what I think is the John Stewart of Singapore. <laughs> it makes fun of politics in a very, very smart fashion. So, PJ, please. Uh, thank you very much, Benjamin. Uh, and thank you for inviting me here to speak today. Uh, this is actually uh, 20 years. 20 years ago, I was a freshman here at Harvard College, 
uh, I was 16, I was kind of stupid. Um, and hopefully now, 20 years later, I'm, uh, I'm a little less stupid. But I'm very pleased to be back after 20 years uh, and to be able to speak here. So, <laughs> thanks. So I want to leave lots of time for discussion. So I'm just going to sketch out a few uh, ideas about Singapore and address some common myths. And the first thing as a historian um, is this idea that there is uh, a clean break in 1965. We see a lot of histories of Singapore that either start or end or see 1965 as this huge turning point. But if you think about it, uh, it's actually the least significant date in our path to becoming an independent country. In 1946, we were split from the rest of Malaya, and the partition of Malaya was so traumatic that the reunification of Malaya became the single most important defining issue of our decolonization in the early 60s. In 1948, the Malayan emergency was declared. And the Malayan emergency, among other things, it suspended important principles of the rule of law, which the British had tried to introduce from uh, their return in '46. but instead they suspended them to address um, the uh, communist insurgency, and they intended it to be temporary, but these important principles of the rule of law were never reinstated in Malaysia and in Singapore. And today they still exist as the things like the Sedition Act, but of course the Internal Security uh, Act and the Criminal Law Bracket Temporary Provisions Act, right? It was intended to be temporary from the very beginning. 60 years later, it's still there on the books. And then our constitution dates from 1955, the Rendell Constitution. It was a colonial constitution meant to promote British control and perpetuate British control as they slowly eased out of Singapore. And that constitution is still here, is still the constitution that we use today, heavily modified, but this, the purpose is still fundamentally the same. It's a constitution designed for control rather than uh, popular sovereignty. Then of course the PAP won power in 1959, right? Not 63, not 65, 59. So that is the point of time in which they started many of the important policies that uh, today we look at as the big successes. And then of course, independence from Britain by a merger was 1963. And that is our point of independence um, where we transition from becoming a colony to becoming a sovereign state as an equal part of the sovereign state of Malaysia. So I always say our independence day is actually uh, 16 September 1963, right? Separation day is like August 1965 and there's a difference so if you think about all those things, by the time you get to 1965, you know, the, uh, the governance, the politics, the institutions of Singapore are very much set. And that is reflected in what happens in 65 because what you see is this rollover of the constitution with only um, you know, Malaysia renamed as Singapore. That's the main change. Apart from that, everything else is carried over. The legislation, the legislative body is exactly the same from the colony into Malaysia as the state assembly and then now becoming the parliament. You know, it was exactly the same. They didn't even have new elections. The prime minister stayed the same. The head of state was still Yusuf Ishak. So there were very, very few changes, right? And these weren't made until December 65 because of course Lee Kuan Yew was uh, badly ill from his drug dependency at that time. So uh, my point is in order to understand uh, Singapore, we need to start at least from 1946 with the um, creation of Singapore as an independent, uh, sorry, a, a sort of um, a single polity separate from the rest of Malaya. And we have to understand that the PAP state is in direct continuity with the late colonial state and has inherited many of its values, its assumptions, its practices. So uh, three common myths about Singapore, and Linda has already addressed the first one, which is the myth of development. This idea that the, you know, we were a fishing village and then the PAP made us rich, which of course is not true. We were rich before um, we became independent. It's, it's a huge oversimplification, right? The third world, the first narrative is just massive oversimplification. Uh, if you think about the problems of the late colonial period, they included things like massive inequality, high property prices, massive housing shortage, high cost of living, 
congestion, overcrowding, unemployment, and systemic colonial discrimination which privileged Europeans and English speakers. And the PAP, as uh, Linda has described, what they did was to uh, tackle all of this through creating um, a lot of very strong social welfare policies. The PAP was elected as a left-wing socialist party and they governed as such and introduced many social welfare policies. And throughout the 60s and 70s, their slogan was actually socialism that works. Because the objection of Socialist International, for example, was not about their policies, but the fact that they continued to use things like detention without trial. They continued to try and concentrate a lot of arbitrary power. They sued their opponents, things like that. Right? That was the objection. The PAP itself was still very strongly socialist. And we've lost sight of that today. We think of the PAP as this right-wing neoliberal party. But of course, you know, it was, that was because of the events of the late 70s and the shift there. And if you think about Singapore today, what are the problems, what are the challenges that really face us? Well, we have massive inequality. We have housing shortages, high property prices, high cost of living, congestion, overcrowding, underemployment, systemic discrimination against minorities. So in some ways, we have come full circle because the PAP abandoned its, abandoned its socialist uh, roots and, has, uh, and withdrew welfare and corporatized a lot of public services. The second myth I want to talk about is the myth of meritocracy, right? which relates to what I was just, the previous myth. As colonizers, the British could not justify their rule through indigeneity, through elections. Their authority stemmed from treaties with the Malay rulers and uh, the power of the, of the guns. So to justify the retention of Singapore, even as they decolonized Malaya, the Federation of Malaya, India, Burma in the 40s and 50s, the British asserted this moral and intellectual superiority over Singaporeans. We know best, we're the British, we, you know, Singapore's future, I think it was the Guardian which said, Singapore's future is tied up intimately with what Britain can offer her. And the PAP inherited the same attitude and it continued on into the PAP Singapore. To be fair, in 59, the PAP had a very strong claim for meritocracy because the candidates they fielded in that election that year came from a wide range of backgrounds and they were really proud of it. They pointed out we have carpenters, we have uh, you know, um, barbers, we have farmers, we have trade unionists, we have a seamstress alongside the lawyers, the academics, the civil servants, the accountants. So there was a huge diversity in terms of linguistic background, professional background, class background, educational background. And this diversity really translates into the strength of the PAP, their connection, the grassroots and their uh, policies that stem from this period. But as they become increasingly authoritarian, they um, move away from this because this authoritarian paternalism within the party drives away many of the talented people who disagree with the leadership. And you see several splits of the party between 55 and 61 as these talented members from diverse backgrounds leave. And a huge chunk, the majority of the party actually, of course, forms the Barisan Socialists in 1961. So the remaining leaders then turn to people who are just like themselves, people they can trust, people they know, to fill these depleted ranks. And power becomes increasingly concentrated in the hands of um, a very narrow, a group of people in terms of social economic background and uh, political ethos. And so this has resulted by the 80s in homogeneity, increasing homogeneity of thought, of values, of experience. Now Michael Barr has written a whole book about the ruling elite of Singapore and how homogenous they are. And he's pointed out, based on all the data, the number one determinant for holding a senior political or civil, so, uh, civil service post in Singapore is a pre-existing relationship with the Lee family, right? That's the number one determinant. You can't go wrong with that. Beyond that, right, there's a few other clear determinants. You're part of the elite if you're male, if you're ethnic Chinese, if you're upper class, if you graduate from one of three different schools, and if you've served in the military as a scholar officer. So you see then the homogeneity of this group, and entry into this group is largely an accident of birth. And within this elite, though, it's important to say within this elite, within their children, competition is very, very fierce. So I know many of you are products of this system, you know, and I know you've 
worked very hard to succeed within the system, but it's important to remember you were born into this elite, apart from, of course, the few tokens who are brought in. So because we have this homogenous gov governing class who think that they, are, uh, they have um, succeeded because of meritocracy, this has bred a very dangerous mentality, I think, because they attribute their achievements to meritocracy, not realizing that they owe a great debt to society for having been uh, put in that position to begin with, right? As the Americans say, you're born on third base and you think you actually hit a triple. And this makes it difficult for our governing class to empathize with the problems faced by ordinary Singaporeans, such as the high cost of living, of healthcare, competitions uh, uh, for jobs with foreigners, the adverse impact of the corporatization of public services, and so on. And I think the, no, no sign uh, shows how much we have abandoned meritocracy than the fact that the clear consensus candidate for Prime Minister, the best person for Prime Minister, has already been ruled out because of his race, right? If Singapore was a meritocracy, we all know who would be the next Prime Minister. It would be Thaman Chambukaratnam, but he can't because he's not Chinese. So the third myth is the myth of vulnerability. And this is this, this idea that Singapore is small, that we are constantly in danger of uh, being swallowed up by bigger neighbors or swamped you know, by the changing uh, global currents. And the Japanese occupation is often cited as proof of this. But think about it. Why was Singapore's conquest by Japan such a shock? If we are so vulnerable, the conquest should have been not a shock, right? It should have been natural, of course. We're, not, we're, so, we're so vulnerable, of course we were conquered. The conquest, the occupation was a shock because Singapore is the least vulnerable place in Southeast Asia. And it took the massive Japanese war machine, which conquered all of Southeast Asia, which fought the British, the Dutch, and the French, and defeated them all, which fought the Americans to a standstill for six months. It took that war machine to conquer Singapore. So why are we so different from the rest of Southeast Asia? You can't say that we are more or less vulnerable than the rest of Southeast Asia. And since 1948, um, our security, sorry, since the war, our security's been underwritten first by the British, now by the Americans, uh, by the Five Power Defense Arrangement, and of course the SAF is by far the strongest military in the region. Other countries see it as a threat, not as a deterrent. So you can only argue that Singapore is no more or less vulnerable than the rest of Southeast Asia. You can even argue that Singapore is the least vulnerable place in Southeast Asia. And so my final point then is about uh, control, about elections. And there's a lot to talk about here, but I think I want, I'll want i just make the point that um, Lee Kuan Yew loves to say that he won elections, he won all these elections and therefore you know, he has popular legitimacy. But it's very important to point out that he never won a free and fair election. Not once, never. Because every single election that he won was preceded first by the arrest and detention of his political opponents. And uh, so between uh, the, the only free and fair election we've had was 1955. The Singaporeans elected David Marshall and the British said, you know, oh, good grief, no, we can't have that. So they colluded with Lee Kuan Yew and Libby Hock to fix the 59 elections. And every election since then has been preceded first uh, between 59 and um, 88 by the detention uh, or arrest or harassment of, political, of um, opposition by lawsuits against them. And then when Singaporeans elected Cham Si Tong and JBJ in the early 80s, that was not enough, right? Two people in, um, however, what was it, 50 something seats back then were seen as too many. So the whole electoral system was changed. Town councils were created for one purpose only, to punish voters in opposition wards, right? It's got nothing to do with efficiency of public services. Before that, HDB ran the whole island. It's, it's one city. You know, you want efficiency, it should be one single utilities board, one single stat board. Instead, um, town councils are mapped to constituencies to punish voters who vote opposition, as those of you who live in Aljunit and Haokang and before that Potong Pasir know very well. Then you have the GRCs, you have the uh, elected presidency, you have the gerrymandering of constituencies, you have cooling off day, and you have all these regulations designed to create barriers for the political opposition. If the PAP was so confident that Singaporeans supported their policies, surely they should have free and fair elections. But my point is just that 
you cannot say Singapore has free and fair elections. So it's really important to remember that when talking about any idea of um, legit popular legitimacy or that the 70% of the vote somehow legitimates what the PAP has done in the past couple of years. So I think I'll stop there. Plenty more to talk about, but I'd love to hear your questions. I agree. Okay, thank you. So I guess the opening remarks reminds me that maybe it's helpful for us to go back to where we started, right? And what, what was it then? I think a lot of the things that you said today were not not intuitive to a lot of people, so I'm going to look at the idea of colonialism. So both of you talked about colonialism as if it's a bad thing, um, in the sense that it was sort of divide and rule and those kind of ideas. But I'm wondering, so what are some opportunities, that, in fact, of this uh, colonialism? You know, such as you know having public service, having an efficient public service, if you will, or even the learning of English. From an economist standpoint, I think Linda argued a few times that English, a good standard of English, was very helpful for us in our development. So I'm wondering. How does that help? And PJ, you mentioned about SAF being actually a threat, not only a deterrent. Could it be that it was in fact of the colonial times that we actually wanted to build a military and actually that was, the, that was where the vulnerability started um, and it was actually a very real concern for some people. Like, is that legitimate at all or you think it's just sort of mumbo jumbo at this point? Do you want to go first? No, no, you, you go because it's your field. Well, okay. <laughs> That's the stuff I wrote about when I was a graduate student. I haven't thought about it since. So. Yeah. Um, look, colonialism is the subjugation of a foreign population. You know, it's the it's the enslavement of a people, and we can't. Um, for all that we say that that British colonialism brought benefits, you have to remember why the British were there. They were there to make money. And they were there, you know, to, in order to make money, um, they not only had to subjugate the people, right, but in order to do things like, you know, say you're a British colonialist, right, say you're Raffles or whoever coming in, and you want to exploit the local uh, mineral resources, but there's very few of you, no matter how strong, powerful your guns, the local population will outnumber you. So what do you need to do? Well, you need to ensure that they will sign contracts that they will honor. In order to do that, you have to make sure they speak your language. In order to do that, they, you have to make sure they follow your laws. So you sweep away their language, you sweep away their customary laws, their culture, and replace it with something that is compliant with your international norms, right? With your, uh, that plugs into globalized trade. So if you, if you say that economic development is a benefit, well, it only happened because the British wanted to make money off our backs. They wanted to make money off what came out of our ground. They wanted to make money taking that from Malaya and shipping it through Singapore's port. So we can't deceive ourselves for, you know, for a moment to think that they had uh, this civilizing mission. If you talk about the French, yes, they had a civilizing mission. But the trade-off is that their colonies economically are less integrated with the global economy and their former colonies are less uh, economically prosperous than the British colonies. But they retain a much stronger local culture and a, a much more distinctive sense of self, right? Um, if you think about the Dutch, I mean the Dutch were horribly exploited in Indonesia but then they introduced the ethical policy from 1900 and th one of the inheritance uh, of this uh, this, this policy is the educational system which gave birth to a generation of Indonesian nationalists who then were able to articulate this idea of Indonesianness that Indonesia has really worked hard to build. Out of the thousands of islands that incorporate Indonesia, they actually have a national identity that transcends local ones. And that is an incredible achievement, right? So other colonies definitely have other benefits. And, but the most important thing, every British colony has left behind a legacy of racial division, horrible racial division. Not because the British cared, but because the easiest way, the cheapest way to govern was to simply take existing arrangements and codify them. It was to keep races apart, right? And to import lots of compliant labor. The Singapore's success is built on the backs of the Bugis. Where are the Bugis today? It was their trading networks which allowed Singapore to be successful. But the British said, well, the problem with the Bugis is they don't have fixed addresses. What is the Bugis? 
Cookies, dodo, alors. Oh. We have an international audience here. Um, okay. Um, sort of uh, trading the tra indigenous trading people of Southeast Asia, who one of the things about the Bugis is that they they don't have fixed addresses because they move around with the tides of the monsoon in Southeast Asia. So this idea of you know, a certain sp a specific place as your home is a very is is very one very much that we have imported from the West, because the Bugis would see the entire archipelago as as their home because you just move in accordance to where the you know you you want to trade where the seasons take you where the weather the tides take you, right? But today, of course, there's all these borders that prevent them. But what the British did was they eased out the indigenous natives because they didn't uh, have. You know, they didn't want to follow British laws and imported people who were happy to work with British capitalism, namely the Chinese, and imported people who were already enslaved, the Indians. So that in many British colonies, what you have is these huge populations who were imported because of colonialism and the British didn't have any intent to integrate, they just wanted to make money. So what you see is this legacy where you have very plural, diverse, um, um, populations, but then uh, there. If you think about Malaysia, Singapore, you know, or Nigeria, or you know, the West Indies, uh, all these places have huge Uganda, you know, legacies. South Africa, or here, you know, that re incredibly poor legacies of of racial conflicts because of that. So we have to be objective about, or rather, you know, we have to historicize what uh, what British colonialism did for us. If you say being plugged into the capitalist economy is good because we have a high standard of living, then yes. But the cost, right, the cost uh, in terms of our spiritual, social development, our national cohesion, uh, these are very real costs that you can see when you compare us with other countries uh, who had very different colonial masks. Yeah. So I'm going to think just from when I used to think about this, um, when we looked at development, uh, post-colonial development as being definitely affected by the kind of colonialism you had. And when I was a graduate student, the big thing was the Hispanic uh, areas like Latin America, and of course in our case, the Philippines, and how the latifundia system of large landholding sort of feudal system uh, caused, you know, affected the way that they developed and they developed slower, whereas, in Korea and uh, Taiwan, which were the beneficiaries of Japanese colonialism, it was somewhat different. The Japanese didn't have these large you know, uh, land holdings, and then of course they were also the beneficiaries of American um, post-war uh, aid, which, re which forced on these countries land reform. And there are many different ways of looking at it. From an economic point of view, one, was in, when, you, when you broke up large land holdings and you had all these small farmers, they created more of a competitive capitalism, uh, which some people say ex explains sort of like Korea, Taiwan. But two, one reason that they did that was to prevent the rise of an indigenous ruling class that would challenge um, whoever was there before. So when the, when the Americans went into Japan, they broke up the zaibatsu, which were the you know you always have to destroy the local um, ruling class. So I mean I think we can go into that uh, in a long way. I'm trying to think back. British did not have a particular system because clearly they were you know Burma ended up extremely differently from you know Malaya and from Singapore. I think we took. I was very interested in in, in PJ's uh, initial remarks because. He was, I hadn't actually thought that much about how what we have now reflects that, other than, you know, the old days when, the, was it the Times of London called Lee Kuan Yew, the yellow skinned Englishman? Did you see that article? Yeah. Yeah, that was all my time, yeah. So, I mean, there was, uh, you know, from that, if I look back, yes, we did. I didn't really think about it that much more. I think the, the, the purpose of my first point was actually what uh, um, Lee Suan said in his um, 
contribution to this book on um, Singapore's 50 years of economic development, where he went into great detail, much more like him, and saying that we, we can't forget that almost everything, including HDB, was there before. You know, it's called SIT, that all these things were there before. And that was more of a sort of trying to remind people that history, not to be a determinist, but history does um, influence what happens afterwards, for good or ill. Right. Yeah. So I think one thing, when I first came to the Kennedy School, a lot of the professors were like, oh yeah, you're from Singapore, you were just one of those autocracies that got lucky. Right, but but then you know I think with hearing PJ when you talk about sort of our political system before it seems to me that we were much more plural than we actually know. So I was wondering if you could talk about that. I think in some of your writings you mentioned because there was a sizable presence of the opposition, um, there was a lot of fiery debates between Marshall and Lee. Yeah, yeah. And so how how did that sort of go down, and how do you think that sort of helped us, if you will? Well, you have to remember who the opposition was, right? The opposition was the PAP. And the fact that they were in a position where they could learn about the political situation in this democratic space, that gave them a lot of practice at um, parliamentary politics and that really uh, set them in good stead when they then won in 59. So the context of Singapore is, um, you know, this, it's, it's very important to remember that Singapore is a little unique in the sense that the majority of the population are um, descendants of immigrants, that uh, our indigenous population was largely wiped out um, from, this is the um, Orang Laut, right, uh, due to, I think Turnbull thinks it was illness or whatever, the Bugis of course were eased out, um, and the, the Malays uh, were uh, the, the Malay population is also heavily immigrant from different parts of the archipelago um, but the Temenggong also the Sultan signed over the sovereignty of Singapore and then uh, the Temenggong shifted his court to modern-day Johor Bahru and took many of his followers with him 